Hey, how's it going? And welcome back to another Pokemon Red and Blue solo run. And today we're going to change it up a little bit. I've been on a mission to do the pre-evolved Pokemon in Gen 1, but I wanted to deviate and do a solo run with a Pokemon a little bit more powerful. I didn't really want to do the best Pokemon, like a Mewtwo or a Gengar, so I decided to give the old tried and true Snorlax a shot. The stereotype of Snorlax is that he is very slow, and in terms of stats, he is very slow. But let me reassure you that in this run, he is anything but. Snorlax has incredible HP and attack on top of having an amazing move pool. And as usual, the rules of the runs are pretty simple. Number one, no using items inside of battle. Number two, I'm only allowed to use Snorlax. No switching, but HM Pokemon are allowed. Number three, no skipping glitches or general exploits outside of the badge boost. And number four, no saving between Elite Four members. You know the drill by this point. Before we dive in, I'd like to go ahead and say that if you enjoy this content, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit that like button as I'm getting pretty close to 10k subs, and I think that would be a pretty cool. Any feedback, discussion, or suggestions for future Pokemon in the comments is also very welcome. And with that, let's dive in. Since Snorlax wasn't ever intended to be this low of a level, it starts out with multiple moves. It gets Headbutt, which is a respectable 70 power stab move for damage, and it gets Amnesia, which is normally an incredible move since Special is a inherently strong stat in Gen 1 due to having both attack and defense wrapped up into one, but Snorlax won't really need to rely on it as much as other Pokemon that get it. It also has Rest, Healing is nice in concept, but Sleep is generally so grossly overpowered in Gen 1 that putting it on yourself doesn't really seem that great. And with that said, we reach Brock at minimum battles just to give it a shot. I'm not sure if it's actually possible, but I did give it a couple of tries before resetting to go back to level up a little bit. I fight the junior trainer in the gym, the two optional bug catchers in Viridian Forest, and I backtrack to fight the optional rival battle before going into Brock for another rematch. After grinding up to level 11, I try once again, and I get past Brock in one try. I get lucky with a flinch, so Geodude can't really set up too many defense curls, and the rest actually came in clutch during the only fight I actually have to use it in the entire run. I get down to 1 HP at one point, but rest is pretty good. It gets you all the way up to full HP. I almost make it through the entire battle just using Headbutt, but for the last tiny sliver of health, I had to use the classic struggle strategy, and that's the first gem down. The fact that Snorlax uses normal moves and didn't have to grind too heavily on the dreaded first gem that's usually a hurdle for most Pokemon and holds them back from being really quick bodes pretty well for Snorlax at this point. I head towards Mount Moon, I pick up the Water Gun, a TM for coverage, and I complete it without needing to reset, and I decide to take on Misty as soon as I get into Cerulean. In the first try, Starmie hits just a little too hard for me. It takes me out, so on the next attempt, I go ahead and I use Amnesia to kind of soften up the blows. And while I do get kind of low, a well-timed critical hit gets us the second badge. And after that, it's time for arrival number two, which is generally the first big hurdle in most runs. Uh, but that's not the case for Snorlax. I get past him on the first try. Pidgeotto graces me with the precious gift of not using Sand Attack, and since Headbutt with stab damage is so strong at this point in the game, I end up making short work of his team without really breaking a sweat. Nugget Bridge and the trainers before Bill get dispatched swiftly, and I soon make my way down towards Vermilion. On the SSN, I make a beeline towards Body Slam, which is probably Snorlax's strongest move the majority of the game, and I head towards rival number three. The fight starts off like most rival fights with a sand attack, but Body Slam is able to plow through the misses, and because of how absurdly powerful it is at this part in the game, I do get pretty low, but a timely paralysis on the War Turtle and not missing on the next Body Slam got me a first try victory once again. Uh, it was a little lucky, but I'm not going to retry it because Sand Attack can suck a lemon. After getting cut, it's time for Lieutenant Surge, and at this point, Body Slam is still racking up a body count, and although the Pikachu paralyzes me via Thunder Wave, I would need to probably be fully paralyzed for about 10 turns in a row to actually lose this battle. And just like that, Snorlax has obtained the third badge with blazing speed. 
I pick up the bike voucher, get the bike, and I head over to Rock Tunnel. And since I have water guns still for coverage, the ground and rock tops are merely a bump in the road. Once again, I don't have to heal or retry anything in this segment. And as usual, we bypass Lavender for now. And inside of the Celadon Pokemon, we pick up the TM for Rockside by giving this little girl some Sodi Pop. I'm excited to finally have a Pokemon that actually learns this move. It's fairly rare in Gen 1. And now it's time for the Rocket Hideout. We get our PP up and we have our first run in with Giovanni. And I'm sure this is a surprise, but I also get past him on the first try. At this point I have a water move and it makes pretty short work of his Pokemon. And if you want to know or if you're keeping track, this means that we haven't had to retry a battle since our very first Misty try. And I bring this up now because this is where I hit perhaps the biggest snag of the run. In hindsight, it was probably the smarter move to go ahead and skip Erica, but I decided I would go in and see what that victory bell was about. Going in, I expected the critical hit Razor Leaves, and I was hoping that we could hang on with our HP, and what I actually got was Poison combined with Rap, and it makes it to where basically I just I can't play the game anymore. And look no further if you really want a strong example of why Rap is one of the strongest moves in Pokemon history in Generation 1. Overall, it takes me five times to get past Erica, and all of my loss attempts ended up the same. Uh, both Victory Belt and Tangela have wrap type moves, and I would always be poisoned, meaning that I would get no turns while they slowly chip away at my massive HP pool and I'd get dwindled down. Uh, one time I made it to the Vile Plume, and I was within range to where a pedal dance could just take me out. The time I actually make it past it, I hit a pretty lucky streak, Victory Bell misses a Poison Powder on turn 1, it takes a Body Slam, and then it goes for the infamous 100% crit Razor Leaf, And but that does allow me to get lethal damage without any status conditions on me, and I'm not sure that the Tangela could even have posed a threat to Snorlax, but a critical hit Body Slam just ignores the question entirely. And I have enough health at this point to comfortably tank two pedal dances as I get past, honestly, what is one of the only major struggles that Snorlax has in the entire run. Uh, spoiler alert. Next up is Pokemon Tower and Rival Number 4. This battle, like with most runs, is often the easiest of the rival battles, but I do get the chance to show off the rarely used Rock Side on his first two Pokemon. The rest of the tower is barely worth mentioning. I have Rock Slide for the two mandatory channelers since normal doesn't really affect Ghost. After rescuing Mr. Fuji, I make the same mistake I make in every single run by thinking that now is a good time to fight rival number 5 before I fight Koga, and I do pick up Earthquake to nearly finish up Snorlax's amazing physical damage moveset, and then I give rival 5 some shots just to kind of gauge how far off I actually am or if I can just do it now. And it does take me several attempts. I actually get extremely close on my first attempt. Uh, I do make the correct choice by choosing Blastoise for my rival starter since it has superior defenses and make it too much for me to take down in the first time. The next attempt I run into a hiccup on the annoying eggs and by the time I'm back to Blastoise I can't really overcome the HP deficit. After another failed attempt, the fourth attempt ends up being successful. I get a crit against the Execute, and by the time I'm at Blastoise, I'm full health and I can trade critical hits with it, and ultimately I pick up the victory. I decide not to heal after the fight, and it turns out to be a mistake on Giovanni number 2. And it's hard to say if I would have won this fight if I was at full health, but after taking lethal body slam damage from the Nitto Queen, I heal up for the next attempt, where it doesn't go that great. I end the fight poisoned and about 34 HP, but we persevere and I take the win once again. Rather than go straight to Sabrina, I go beat up my brother, and then I head straight towards the Fusa City Gym. I come here first because I have Earthquake, and it makes all of Koga's Pokemon crumble like paper, except for the Weezing who decides it's better to commit suicide rather than get hit with an Earthquake, and it's his choice. After that I hit up Safari Zone and I get the last two HMs and this is where my jaw drops when I actually discover that it's Erica's gym badge that allows you to use strength outside of battle and not Sabrina. I learn something new every single time I do one of these Gen 1 solo runs. Next up I go to face Sabrina since her Pokemon are frail defensively and Snorlax is attack based. Kadabra decides it wants to critically hit me on turn 1. And it's okay since I have nearly as much health as I had when I ended the Bellsprout run. But I do set up some amnesias to soften up future blows. 
Venomoth does its best attempt to set up Alakazam by paralyzing me, but a miss by Alakazam on turn 1 into an earthquake makes me take the battle and gets me the 6th badge on yet another first try. I surf down from Pallet Town, and after some Tombstoner brother, I get Blaine and his awful AI. I actually fail the first attempt, I try to just brute force my way through with Earthquake only, and I get burned along with being outsped and I just get chipped down, and remember that I'm close to minimum battles at this point, and Snorlax's leveling group uh, has me a whopping 7 levels lower than the Arcanine at this point in the game. I go back in, and this time I set up Amnesia to boost all my stats up with the badge boost, and unsurprisingly the fight becomes much easier. At the end of the fight I get the chance to learn Harden, and I decide to go ahead and learn it over Amnesia due to the fact that I don't really value special as much on Snorlax, and you can use Harden 6 times as opposed to 3, and thus it gives me more attempts to use the badge boost. At this point, all that's really left is Giovanni, and I stand by the belief that the third fight against him is always going to be the weakest. His move pools for his Pokemon are atrocious, and even at my level disadvantage, Harden allows me to get enough badge boost to get past all of his Pokemon. I do get poisoned and almost into the red health by the end, but his awful moves like Tackle and Poison Sting don't pack enough of a punch to take out my big BV boy. Now, there's only 6 fights left between Snorlax and the end of the game, and although I'm not using elite optimal pro gamer speedrun strats, I'm at sub 3 hours, which is extremely fast. But first we do have to get through Rival 6. The first time I make it to Blastoise and Hydro Pumps combined with Leech Seeds are just too much for me to really overcome. When I take my second shot, I don't take any chances. I deliver 2 Rock Slides to Pidgeot and then I decide it's optimal to set up your Hardens on Rhydon, and after it goes down, the other Pokemon swiftly get taken out, but Blastoise does take several hits, and I can't state enough how powerful Blastoise is uh, if you're doing like a neutral solo run, just due to how tanky it is. But anyway, I take the win in two overall tries. And I'd like to say that I've always found it hilarious that once you beat your rival here, you beat him every step of the way in the entire game, and at this point he says, you could use more practice. Anyway, I make my way to Victory Road, uh, and I'm just about a few minutes over three hours of in-game time. I skip all the trainers, and now it's time to talk about the Elite Four a little bit. I don't really expect a Cubone level challenge, and my move pool seems like it should do extremely well against all of them. At this point, my moveset going into the Elite Four is Earthquake and Rock Slide for powerful physical damage coverage moves, Body Slam for stab neutral damage against most things, and Harden so I have a way to badge boost myself six times if I need to. And it always feels great to me when I use solely physical movesets on a Pokemon in Generation 1 because it's absolutely dominated by special, uh, specifically by moves like Psychic and Ice Beam. And I'm also... It's worth noting here that I'm at ex an extreme level disadvantage during the final stretch. I'm only level 45, but I do have 10 rare candies, so keep that in mind, and I can use those as I need them. Moving into Loralee, let's see how we fared initially. The plan going in is that Rock Slide is super effective against her team, and from there, it looks like it'll be an effective strategy to utilize. Dugong doesn't really take much to go down, but Cloyster does have the highest defense in Gen 1, and it can take four rock slides for me to take it down. It gets in some chip damage, and Slowbro more or less kind of does the same thing, but worse. It takes a metric ton of body slams to take it down, and I do try to set up some hardens to make the rest of the fight easier. Jinx can also tank a rock slide, and by the time Lapras comes in, I'm in range where basically any attack could have taken me out. I end up doing this fight several times. I mess around with or without rare candies, but I found out that... If you take a simple growl and your attack gets lowered, it's a death sentence and you may as well just go ahead and reset because it cripples how much damage you do. I get some decent tries in overall, but even on good tries, Lapras just has really good defense and he can easily tank my physical moves if I get low. Overall, it ended up taking me about 5 tries to get past Lorelei, and then hindsight, uh, going ahead and putting Thunderbolt on Snorlax was almost assuredly the play to go with. I end up using all but three of my rare candies on the successful try, 
and then I eventually set up Hardens on the Cloister, and I stay healthy enough to take out the rest of the Pokemon, and this is really the last time Snorlax is going to struggle in the Elite Four. Bruno is, of course, Bruno, and I don't take any chances still. I set up six Hardens, and I Earthquake, and throw in a couple of Body Slams for good measure, and it makes short work of him to absolutely no one's surprise. Bruno is just not very good, guys. Next up is Agatha, and as always, is the most annoying member to fight, if anything else. I wouldn't say that I got particularly lucky against Agatha. I do get confused from the very start. I hit myself multiple times throughout the fight, but Snorlax has an elite level attack stat and access to Earthquake, which absolutely demolishes Agatha's Pokemon. Gobat does take multiple hits to take down, and I do get slight luck with Haunter missing its hypnosis attempt, but Arbok gets a paralysis off on me, but overall it's not very tanky. The final Gengar confuses me once again, but I do win the coin flip, get off a lethal earthquake to get past Agatha on my first try as well. Uh, Snorlax's HP definitely allowed me to kind of muscle through some of the awful status conditions here, and I'm pleased with the result. Heading into Lance, I opt to go ahead and learn Thunderbolt over Body Slam. The all physical moveset is tempting, but I don't want to take a risk with Gyarados. And looking ahead about how the Blastoise has been able to tank my physical moves throughout the game, it seems like the smart choice to go with. And it turns out to work just like I thought. Since I'm not actually weak to Gyarados, I do set up some Hardens and I pull the trigger a little bit early on Thunderbolt because I don't want to leave it lingering around. And Gyarados, as always, is going to crumble to anything electric because it's double super effective against it. The rest of the Pokemon I'm equipped to handle. Earthquakes do heavy damage to the Dragonairs. Aerodactyl takes a single Rock Slide. And Dragon Knight's flying subtyping makes him weak to Rock Slide as well. I get a crit on him, but it's not enough. To get the one shot but Snorlax has pretty much tanked everything all the hyper beams up to this point and the second lethal rock slide is inevitable as I take out Lance on the first attempt as well. Next up is the champion battle and at this point I hope I can just go ahead and make it a clean sweep at this point and just go ahead and get out of this run the fastest I've ever done it. I'm not weak to Pidgeot and since it's a physical attacker I go ahead and get as hard as I can hard as possible and a single Thunderbolt ends up taking it out with my boosted stats. Alakazam is as frail defensively as always, and I outspeed it with the badge boost, which is fantastic. It's funny, actually. And it goes down to a single Earthquake. And if you can say anything about Rhydon, it's that it can actually survive a super effective Earthquake. So I will be mailing it its consolation prize in the mail very soon. So Rhydon, if you're listening, you can look forward to that. Arcanine is also weak to Earthquake, and I claim my next victim in the way of Snorlax's Warpath. And then finally, the Eggman comes in, and he does his absolute best to annoy me, and actually succeeds. It survives two Rock Slides, and then eventually it puts me to sleep, and it then taunts me with low damaging moves, chipping me down to about half health. But it only succeeds in delaying the inevitable. Eventually the game decides I can actually play the game again, and one more neutral rock slide takes him out. And at this point, I'm fairly low on health going into the Blastoise. Instead of going for Thunderbolt that I just talked about doing on him, I actually go for Earthquake turn 1 since my special stat's pretty poor, and I get a critical hit to take it to half health. Blastoise then does its best pacifist attempt, and it does nothing but go for withdrawals. Two more Thunderbolts eventually take it out, and that's the end of the run. Laura Lee took me several tries to solidify a strategy and to avoid the awful luck that I was having, but I do manage to basically one-shot the Elite Four after that. So what do I think about Snorlax? It was much better than I expected. A 3 hour, 36 minute casual run feels like a very elite time to me, especially compared to my earlier runs, and I'm well aware that my other runs uh, are pre-evolved Pokemon. But it's nice to see how a Pokemon that has actual good stats and a really good move pool performs compared to that. It honestly makes me curious how other Pokemon that are fully evolved would do. Or just some of the Pokemon that have really nice stats. And we just might mess around with that in the future, I'm not sure yet. Overall, it's hard to compare Snorlax. Uh, it's the first non-pre-evolved run that I've actually done. And while the timing is fantastic, 
I only have the other four runs to compare it to, and it crushes all of them. And keep in mind that in real life time, this run was only about two and a half hours, and there were very long stretches where Snorlax never had to retry a battle or heal. In fact, there was only about three battles in the entire game I had to retry about four or five times. In conclusion, Snorlax is stereotyped as being extremely slow, but a solo run proved that it is anything but. I'm aware of some of the other heavy hitters, and I know off the top of my head that Gengar and Mewtwo could beat it, but I'm not really sure who else could. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this content, and if you made it this far, come on, go bring it in. I appreciate you, and as always, feel free to discuss or suggest anything in the comments below, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.